when Brother Adam was teaching, I was, and you made mention of three Hebrews and Daniel. Uh, I'm going to turn there and look at something just real quick before we get into our lesson. So, in Daniel chapter 3, when they were before Nebuchadnezzar, They had probably a lot more faith than we do. As Brother Adam was pointing out, he doesn't always just come down and solve the issue right away, does he? Yeah. No. You know, they stood there after not bowing down to the idol and being faithful to God. In verse 17 it says, If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. We we are usually okay with that first part, aren't we? We know God is able to deliver. And you know, I I have full confidence that God is able, that he has the power and ability to even now completely remove. You know, the, the virus from Brother Junior and really all those in the church who are sick. Yeah. And we begin to waver is in the second part of this verse when said and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O King. We say, Well, I know God's able, but I'm not quite sure if he's going to. And then we I think we all fall short on the next verse where it says, But if not be it known unto thee, O king, we will not serve thy God, nor worship the gold image which thou hast set up. You know what? We know God is able, and we believe he is going to, but you know if he doesn't, it'll be all right. And we don't like that part, do we? Say, well, God, I know you're able to heal me, and I believe you will heal me, but if you don't, there's going to be a problem. That's not what we say, but that's how we act. Amen. No full faith and trust in God requires thy will be done, O Lord. Or as Christ said, not my will, but thine be done. And when we come to that place, we can have sweet assurance in the person of Christ and in our God, Jehovah. Okay. I want to turn over to John chapter 1 for our message. I would like to look at what little bit we have about the life of Philip, the apostle. John chapter 1, verses 43 through 46 will begin our message today. <clears throat> Here, John had, I mean, excuse me, Christ had just called Andrew and Peter. And it says on the next day, the day following, verse 43, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and find us Philip, and say unto him, Follow me. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael, and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses, in the law, and the prophets, did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip saith unto him, Come and see. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we begin. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, Lord, for the blessing of life that you are faithful to give us, even though we often take it for granted, Lord. We do thank you for this opportunity to still gather with thy people here today, Lord. But we certainly do pray for those that are out sick, that you might heal them up, Lord, according to thy will. We pray especially for Brother Junior, that you might ease him of this sickness, Lord, that you might restore him to full health. Just pray that we would be found doing thy will. Let us be pleasing and honoring to thee. I pray that you could all the glory out of the message here today, Lord, that you might be lifted up, that the name of Christ would be glorified, that the saints would be edified. Just help us, Lord, to be more faithful to thee and more busy about the work you've called us to do. Lead, guide, and direct by the Holy Spirit. And we thank thee for Christ and 
Follow and receive in and through him and all that he has done for us. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, here we find the calling of Philip. Now, there were three Philips mentioned in the scriptures. There's Philip the Tetrarch, brother of Herod. If you recall, his, it is his wife who Herod would take, and John would say, you can't do that lawfully, and John would be beheaded because of that. And there was Philip the Evangelist, which we were probably all familiar with. He was one of the seven that was ordained out of the church of Jerusalem. He would preach to the Ethiopian eunuch and baptize him. He's predominantly displayed throughout the book of Acts. And then we have Philip the Apostle. We don't know a whole lot about him. Outside the book of John, we really have no accounting of him, of him other than being listed among the disciples. But here we see his first mention, if you will, the first time he comes into the scene that Christ would go forth into Galilee and find us Philip and saith unto him, Follow me. As we see from verse 44, Philip was from Bethsaida, the same city that Andrew and Peter were from. As far as I can tell, it was a, a town on the coast of the Sea of Galilee. It was a it literally means I think, house of fish. But we don't know much about Philip's history. And there's no account of who his parents were, what his occupation was. There's really no account of who he was, but Christ comes to him and says, follow me. That's a really a, a tall task that was in the fall of Christ. Now we we say we are followers of Christ as Christians, but to really follow Christ fully requires sacrifice, it requires dedication. Let's turn over to Luke chapter 9 for a minute. Luke chapter 9, we'll begin in verse 23. had just addressed who he is, who the people say he is, and who the disciples say he is. Verse 23 says, And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. To follow Christ, he says you have to take up your cross daily, not just on Sunday, not just Wednesday and Sunday, or not when you feel like it, but every day we must follow Christ. And taking up a cross is no easy task either. Take up a cross and follow him, he says. If you recall, when Christ was crucified, he was so weak and beaten down that he could not even carry his own cross, literally, up Calvary. They had a compelled Simon to help him. Certainly carrying the cross, it's, it's heavy, it's a burden, if you will. But with the fall of Christ, there's a great gain, isn't there? Not necessarily in this life. But the fall of Christ is a, really leads to blessings that this world doesn't know about. Yeah. We'll go on down to verse 57. We have a few types of followers here presented. Verse 57 to the end of the chapter, it says, And it came to pass that as they went in the way, they had left one village and went to another. So the certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Well, this man, I hope he thought he was going to gain Something physically from following Christ. You know, we might say, well, he had good intentions. He said, I'll follow thee whither, so I'll go. But well, Christ really didn't have anywhere to go but to the cross, didn't he? He didn't have a home to 
of his own. It says here, the foxes have holes, the birds of the air, they have nests. But Christ, the Son of Man, he doesn't even have a place to lay his own head. Yeah. You know that following Christ does not necessarily lead to worldly riches and great physical possessions. You know, God can certainly bless that way, but there's no guarantee of them following Christ. There's none of this health and wealth, prosperity, gospel stuff. Christ does not promise that to those who follow him. In fact, most of the disciples were the poorer sort, and they didn't get rich by following Christ. In fact, I sometimes marvel at how their needs were even provided for. They left their nets, they left their businesses, and they went and followed Christ. Most of us would be like the others here, well, I gotta go do this other stuff first, God, then I'll follow you. But no, following Christ does not necessarily lead to worldly blessings, if you will. But notice what the next verse says. And he said unto another, Follow me. He said, Lord, first suffer me to go and bury my father. Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. Well, this man had a in our eyes, probably a decent request. I just need to go and bury my father. You know, when God calls us to do something, we are leave all else to follow him. But we are like this person. We have to have all our ducks in a row, if we will. We have to make sure everything is lined up and taken care of, and then we can follow Christ. That is not... That's not the way that pleases God. We have to follow him first and foremost. He says, let the dead bury their dead. Let the things of this world take care of themselves, if you will. Yeah. You know, Christ in Matthew chapter 6 said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, and all these things, speaking of their needs, will be added unto you. You know, having a family, that's not an easy thing to do, is it? You want to make sure they're taken care of. You want to make sure your bills are paid. But oh, how we are to seek God first, then everything else will fall in line. Most of the time it comes down to a lack of faith, though. Say, so, God, I know you want us to do this, but we got we really got to do this other thing first. No, just simply follow what God has told us to do. Go thou and preach the kingdom of God. Verse 61, he gives us another follower, supposed follower here. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee. Again, well, I'm going to follow you, Lord. But notice what he says, but let me first go bid them farewell which are at home, at my house. Again, he, his priorities were not in line, were they? He was not willing to just forsake all else and follow Christ. He said, well, first I'm going to go home and I'm going to tell them all bye and make sure they're good to go. Then I'll follow you, God. But Christ said unto him, and Jesus said unto him, verse 62, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. You can't hold on to the world with one hand and hold on to Christ with the other. That's Christ said, so you can't Start out with the kingdom of God and look back at the world. That didn't turn out too good for Lot's wife, did it? No, we must simply leave our nets and follow Christ as the disciples did. But follow me was the command of Philip, as we saw in our text. That necessitates that we leave all else and follow him. That necessitates that we leave behind the world and the things of the world and seek first God. Yeah, I know he was going to literally follow Christ around for about three and a half years, but we are still to follow Christ in our daily lives. Through his word, through the example that he left us, through his commands that he's left us, through the com commission that he's given to us as his church, we are to follow Christ. And the uh, the hard part is we're to follow him first and foremost above all else. 
to follow me was not an easy task. I don't know what Phil's profession was. But you had no doubt he had to leave it behind or put it at least in second place to follow Christ. As far as we can tell, Philip follows him. In fact, the very first thing he does is go and tell Nathaniel. Go back to our text in John. Nathaniel, who is also called Bartholomew in the scriptures. I don't know if he was kin or a friend or what he was, but Apparently, Philip must have been close to him. Because the very first thing he does not go is and tells Philip about Christ. I mean, Philip goes and tells Nathaniel about Christ. Verse 44, or excuse me, 45, Philip findeth Nathaniel and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. You know, he goes to him and says, we found the Christ. He kind of elaborates on that. This is the one who Moses writes about, who the prophets prophesied of. And here he is, Jesus of Nazareth. So we should be as much excited to tell others about Christ. And yet, I think oftentimes we're ashamed that we're too... It's too inconvenient to tell others about Christ. <laughs> One thing I found interesting here is he didn't just think it was Andrew that went to Peter and said, here is the Christ. But he says this is, he goes right back to the Old Testament and says this is the one that Moses wrote about. This is the one that the prophets write about. The whole Old Testament points to Christ. As Brother Adam mentioned, we spent 13 weeks looking at how the sacrifice is pointed to Christ and other prophecies in the Old Testament. So really, you can go just about anywhere in the Old Testament and find a road to Christ. In fact, uh, Christ himself finally tells the Jews this in John 5, 39. He says, Search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Yeah. The Old Testament is not some you know, history book that we need to relegate to the sidelines. There's very much Christ in the Old Testament just as there is in the New Testament. There is very much a display of God and who He is and Christ and what He would do throughout the Old Testament. So the Scriptures of that day were the Old Testament, and they pointed to Christ, that Christ was coming, that Christ would die. And yet the Jews, in all their supposed knowledge, could not see that the very Christ was right before them. No search the scriptures, for they testify of me. Certainly he was the one that Moses wrote about in the law. Certainly he was the one that the prophets did prophesy about. And Philip was seemingly excited that he was there, that he was right there before his own eyes. If you know the rest of the story here, you know, Nathaniel, and it says here, is there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Well, Nazareth wasn't exactly a, a prized city of the Jews. Not like Jerusalem or Bethlehem. But Philip just said, come and see. Come and see for yourself. So we can tell others about Christ till we're blue in the face. Sometimes we just need to tell them to go see for yourself, if you will. Go and see Christ for who he is. You know, if you know through the rest of the chapter, Nathaniel would go and he would eventually believe and Christ would tell him, I saw the under the fig tree. And I think it finally clicked with the thing a little. He must be the Christ. So we'll go over to John chapter 6. We see the next mention of Philip. 
John chapter 6, verses 5 through 7. Here we have the account of the feeding of the 5,000. So Christ had been talking with his disciples, and this great multitude had followed them to where they were. And I believe Mark's account tells us that he had compassion on them, done miracles among them, and he said that they were as sheep without a shepherd, so he taught them much things. And also in Mark's account, it, it says it was getting late in the day, and the disciples were basically saying, Lord, why don't you just send them on home so they can eat? We're tired, we're ready to go home too. But Christ was going to display a great miracle here. Verse number five says, When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great co company come to him, he saith unto Philip, When shall we buy bread that these may eat? Well, he singles out Philip here. I don't know any particular reason why. Some have suggested, suggested that they were near to Philip's hometown. Perhaps he would know a place to go and buy bread. And sometimes God singles us out, if you will, test us, to try us. As we see in verse 6 here, it says, This he said to prove him, that is, Christ said this to prove or to test Philip, for he himself knew what he would do. But Christ didn't ask because he didn't know how in the world they were going to feed these men. He looks up and says, well, how are we going to feed all these people here? But because Christ did not know, well, certainly he knew exactly what he was going to do. The disciples didn't know. In fact, they were doubting, if you will, all the way up until the miracle happened. Well, sometimes God tries us, we will. It's always for our good, though. It always causes us to grow in faith. You know, James, I'm going to turn there for a minute. James chapter 1. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4 say, I rather count all joy when you fall into diverse temptations or Divers, diverse trials, knowing this that the trying of your faith work is patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. So our trying of our faith always causes us to grow spiritually. As he says here, it worked at patience and patience will eventually perfect us or complete us, if you will. If you compare that with Romans chapter 5, Paul elaborates on what happens in this particular situation. Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 5 say, And not only so, but we glory in tribulations, knowing, or glory in tribulations also, knowing that the tribulation, excuse me, that tribulation worked with patience, and patience, experience, and experience hope. And hope makes it not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. So the trying of our faith, he says it works patience, but then patience, experience, and experience brings hope. Hope makes us not ashamed because hope gives us even more assurance in God who he is and what he's able to do. We think about this whole coronavirus thing. I thank God that He has spared me and my family from it. Does that mean I'm any better than Adam, who had it first? <laughs> no. Perhaps Adam has more faith now that he's went through it, that God is able to deliver him. Yeah. But we can't always blame the trying of our faith on. You know, well, you must be doing something wrong. Bad things are happening to him. You know, God often tries our faith that we may 
grow spiritually, that we may trust in Him even more than we did before. Uh, I've often used the example of Lazarus. God, or Christ could have easily went over to Bethany and healed Lazarus, and certainly it would have been a great miracle, and all would have been well, so to speak, but yet how much more glorious was it that He would go and show His power over death and raise Lazarus after he'd been dead for three days. You know that the three Hebrews there in Daniel chapter 3, I'm sure they were not thinking well when they said God's able to deliver us and we he will deliver us from thy hand, O king. I doubt they were thinking God's going to cast us into this furnace of fire and he's going to come down and walk among us and we're going to come out not smelling like smoke. That's not the way the natural man thinks. Even as a saved man, that's not our first inclination. Yeah. No, I'm sure they would have been satisfied with God delivering them safely from it, or even if they were consumed by it, they would have been okay with that. Yet God often has something greater in mind than what we think of. He said the disciples here, they were just ready to go home. They were probably tired, said so it was the end of the day. They were getting hungry, no doubt. The people here were getting hungry, and if you know anything about people when they're hungry, they get a little moody. So for, perhaps they weren't in the greatest spiritual mindset here, and yet God would still work a great miracle among them. He asked Philip, when shall we buy bread that these may eat? Notice Philip's response back in verse 7. He says, Philip answered him, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. I think Brother Larry pointed out this recently, but a penny worth was the Roman denarius, denarius which was about a day's wage for the average person at times. So 200 penny worth would have been 200 days worth of working. You know, just for comparison, the average person today works 250 days a year if they work five days a week. So that was nearly a year's salary, and yet he says it wouldn't be sufficient for them to even take just a little bit. You know, I'm not sure how much bread you could buy. You know, Gill, in his commentary, suggested that they could buy enough for 2,000 men with 200 penny worth of That wouldn't be enough to feed 5,000 men, besides women and children, would it? I mean, I guess if you gave everyone just a little pinch off, you might have enough to spread it out. He says that there wasn't enough that they even may take a little bit, just enough to even be an appetizer, if you will. And that's how we often look at situations, don't we? We say, well, God, I've got this big problem and just a little, I don't have enough here that I can get through it. Well, my own self, I'm looking back at most of 2020 when I was laid off and you know at first things were okay, but eventually I'm not sure quite how I made it from October to March of 2021. Yet yeah, God is able to do with a little, a lot more than a man can do with a lot, can't he? Yeah. You know, they were going to go out and buy this 200 penny worth of bread. No doubt a large amount of bread, but still not enough. And yet they said, well, God, we, we don't have enough here. What are we going to do? If you know the rest of the story, one of the disciples would speak up and say, well, there's a, this boy over here, and he's got five barley loaves and two little fish, but where are they among so many? Just a little bit enough for a person or two in our estimate. You know, five barley loaves was not like our loaves of bread. They were basically little cakes. But even if they were five loaves of bread sliced up like we have a day at the grocery store, you still weren't going to feed 5,000 men with that. And yet, Christ didn't say, well, go out and buy some more. Go out and cast a net and we'll drag in a big old draught of fish. 
No, he says, make the men to sit down. And for the disciples, we're thinking, well, I don't know what Jesus is thinking here. We're going to pass out a couple pieces of bread and cut up these fish and make everybody mad. No, God has greater plans than our plans, doesn't he? Yeah. So he asked Philip this, that he may prove him, that he might test him. You know, oftentimes God calls us to do certain things or to witness certain things that he may prove us, that he may try our faith. They're not always pleasing to the flesh, and they're certainly not usually a, something we can do on our own. Said the disciples, they would have had their way, they would have sent everybody home and they would have went home themselves and probably went to bed. Maybe got to themselves some, someone to eat at their house. And I'm sure they would have been okay, but yet they wouldn't have seen the great miracle that God would have them see. Oftentimes, we're like the disciples, content just everything being normal as it would, and rather than seeing. The great workings of God. You no, know, here we have Philip being tried. Certainly the other disciples need to be proved as well. But for whatever particular reason he singled out Philip here. So don't be you know depressed or saddened or think that God is picking on you. Sometimes he calls you to to go through something. And sometimes he has to prove you as he did Philip here. Right. Philip, maybe he was thinking, well, Christ, why are you looking at me? Well, Judas, he's the one who carries the bag. Or, you know, Peter and Andrew and John and James, they're the fishermen. Why don't you have them go catch some fish? No, Philip has proved here, and certainly he his faith grew from this experience. Yeah. Let's go over to chapter 12. Like I said, if you know the whole account there, these five little barley loaves and two fish would feed the 5,000, they would take up 12 baskets full. Early enough for the disciples to eat and take home as well. And yet they were content just to send everybody home. John chapter 12, verses 20 and 21, here we see Philip once again. Christ was <clears throat> had just raised Lazarus, and so a lot of people were coming to see him. In verse 20, it says, And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came therefore to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Philip was a, a Greek name. It meant lover of horses. So I suppose that he most likely lived or at least grew up among the Greek people in the area. So perhaps that is why they came to Philip, the Greeks that would come up to worship. They came to him and they says they desired him or they requested of him saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. First, it must be a note that Philip must have been acting like a disciple of Christ for them to come to him. I'm always amazed, if you will, to hear other people speaking and say something like this. Oh, you go to church? I didn't even know you were a Christian. What a poor testimony as a child of God. To, yeah. Oh, how we ought to so live for God and for Christ that they would see it in our lives. You know, the same grace of God that is saving you ought to be the same grace of God that changes your life. But they came to Philip and they said, Sir, we would see Jesus. 
What a simple yet profound request, wasn't it? I don't think that they really wanted to go and just look upon Jesus. Perhaps they did. Maybe they came with the wrong intent. The scriptures really don't tell us their reasoning or they said we would see Jesus. If you recall from Isaiah 53, it says there is he has no form nor comeliness, and we shall see him. There is no beauty that we should desire him. And contrary to the popular teaching, if you will, he was not necessarily a good looking man. Probably more fit than the average American, but yet he was not some handsome man like Absalom or there was no beauty that you should desire him physically. But yet the beauty of Christ is not what he looks like, but it's who he is. Yeah. And that is what we ought to desire. To be with Christ, to be in his presence. <laughs> now, ultimately, we'll be in his presence when we pass from this life. But oh, that his presence will be us even now ought to be our desire. But is it our desire really to see Jesus, we will, to be in his presence, to, to see him for who he really is? Or I think oftentimes we come to the church building and we just are satisfied to go through the routines and you know, sing a few songs, listen to some teaching and preaching and go home. Oh, how we ought to desire to meet with him, to be in his presence when we come here. When we are in prayer, how we ought to desire to be in his presence there. But when we're, I you know Brother Larry does it, and I sometimes do too, when I'm alone in the car listening to some good gospel songs, I desire to be in his presence there as well. Do we really want to see Christ for who he is, or are we content with, you know, the, the way the world portrays him as just some tolerant hippie guy that loves everyone. No, see Christ for who he is is not only a great blessing, but will give us great, as you can say, assurance in difficult times. To see Christ for who he is will cause us to see God for who he is. We'll get to that here in our next point. Know how we ought to desire to see Christ. We ought to desire to be like Mary. We don't have to turn in there, but in Luke 10, you know the account of Mary and Martha. And Christ went to their house. It says that Mary was found sitting at the feet of Jesus, and Martha said, it said that Martha, she was covered about. She was busy about the coming about with much serving, I would say. She was busy trying to make sure everything was in order, make sure I don't know if she was cooking some food, everything was just the way it ought to be. And yet Mary was content just to be in the presence of Christ. Oh well, it ought to be a Mary in the Martha world. Our world is always telling us to be busy about something, to be doing this, to be doing that, to, whether it's work or social media or entertainment, watching TV and going out to do so. Not saying those things can't have their place, but oh, how much more desirous it ought to be of us that we would be in the presence of Christ. It would do us far greater good to sit at the feet of Jesus than it would to Spend hours of being entertained by the world. But here we see Philip once again, no doubt, living or portraying himself as a follower of Christ, that the Greeks would come and say, Sir, we would see Jesus. And we'll go to our, you know, the rest of it tells us that Philip would go to Andrew, and then Andrew and Philip would go to Jesus. And, Jesus to give this discord about his hour that was coming, that he was about to suffer and to die. So let's go on to verse, or chapter 14, the last 
portion of our message here today. Chapter 14 of John, verse 6 through 10. And the first part of this chapter is a popular one where Christ says, Let not your heart be troubled, you believe in God, but you will also me in my Father's house or many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto my own, or unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. So continuing on this topic, he, you know, Thomas would ask him, well, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know where we're going? I'll pick up in verse 6 where Christ answers him. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Christ is the only way of salvation. You know, he's not one of many ways or the best of several ways, but he is the one and only way. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Knows he, he is the way, the truth, and the life. We can only, he's the only way, he's the only truth, and he's the only eternal life. It's not found in Muhammad or Buddha or any of these others. No man comes from the Father but by me. Verse 7, he says, If you had known me, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth you know him and have seen him. You can't have God the Father without God the Son, and vice versa. Yeah. This is where the, quote, Jehovah's Witnesses, or the Russellites, or as Brother Forrest Keener used to call them, Satan the Salesman, it's where they go wrong. Christ was very much the Son of God, as much as he was God the Son. And you can't have Jehovah without Jesus. You can't have Lord Jesus Christ without the Father God. Yeah. Verse 7, excuse me, verse 8, here we find Philip. And Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it suffices us. I don't know if Philip was that ignorant or if he was that ambitious. Just show us, just show us the Father and we'll be satisfied, God. You know, there was some truth in what he's saying, we'll get to that in a moment, but the whole God and all his glory would have meant certain death. If you remember back in Exodus chapter 33 when Moses basically had the same request, show me thy glory. What did God say in verse 20? No man can see me and live. Well, this flesh cannot behold God in all his glory and live. So I'm not sure if Philip really understood what he was asking here. Show us the Father and it suffices us. But when we see the Father, or when we behold him with our own eyes, it will suffice us. It will satisfy one too. Yeah. When we behold God in all his glory, all the things of this earth will matter no more. You know, coronavirus won't even be a thought in the back of our minds when we behold God in all his glory. All the trials and troubles of this life will be nothing compared. As Paul says, the sufferings of this life are not worthy to be compared to the glory which will be revealed in us. But oh, we can see a glimpse of that by faith, can't we? By faith in the person of Jesus Christ. I think that's really what Christ says in the next two verses here. Verse 9 says, Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long with you, so long time with you, and yet ye have not known me, Philip? You know, they have been together about three and a half years at this point. He says, Philip, don't you know who I am by now? Yep, it takes us a long time to get the picture too. He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how saith thou me, show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, and the words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwells in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am the, I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works' sake. Christ says he is in the Father, the Father is in him. 
You could sum it up as he said in John 10, verse 30, I and my Father are one. Though Jesus was 100% God embodied in a fleshly body, really he possessed the full glory of God, but it was it's veiled by the flesh, if you will. But all that he did was of God and through God, the Father. And once again, you can't see the Father without Christ, and you can't see Christ without the Father. They are inseparable, if you will. And yet there are many, many today that seek God and want to leave Christ out, or they seek Christ and want to leave God out. We, we use the term God that oftentimes refer to the Father, but both are God, and the Holy Spirit as well. You cannot separate God and from himself, though. You cannot separate God the Father from God the Son. Vice versa, you cannot even separate really the Holy Spirit from the rest of them. God is who he is, and we must believe who he is, whether we can understand it and wrap our minds around it. But Philip here, he just show us the Father, and it suffices this. Like I said, it, I think he must have been ignorant of what that really meant, because it would have been sudden certain death for him and all that be held. But really we see God through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. We can really see the full glory of God through the person of Christ. You know, they physically saw him, but by faith we still see him today. There's still no other way but to follow but by him. So Philip said so we don't have a whole lot about him, but we see these four particular accounts of him. How he was called, how he was tested, how he had a testimony, and how that then he must have been just like us and not always understanding everything quite the way he ought to. The only time he's mentioned again is in Acts chapter 1 verse 13 when the disciples and the women were gathered in the upper room after Christ had ascended. The tradition says that he preached in Phrygia, and he was a martyr at Heropolis. We don't have any biblical account of him, of what exactly happened to him, but that's what history tells us happened to him. So that we would simply follow Christ, as Philip did, or that we would simply live for Christ, as Philip did, Although we would endure trials that Philip did and grow in faith. But let us not forget who Christ is, as Philip seemed to have here at our last text. So if you don't know Christ as your Savior, the only way through him, the only way to be saved is through him. The only way to God is through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. As he plainly tells Philip this here. But what if history holds true? Although we would be as faithful as Philip was to, to preach even unto death. But let us not fear death. Let us not fear what man may do to us. As Christ said, fear not him that killeth by him. Fear him that he hath killed you, hath power to cast into hell, yea, and send you fear him. Yeah. We are to fear God, not man. And even still, I'm reminded of the words of Spurgeon during the glory outbreak in London. He said, sudden death is sudden glory. Yeah. You know, whether we go by way of sickness and disease or whether we go by martyrdom or some natural causes, whether we die in some freak accidents, the glory that awaits the child of God is far greater than anything this life has to offer. Let us always keep that in view. Close with that thought.